Hello, welcome to COM222. Today we'll be talking about cultural identity and issues of belonging. The most central function of identity is to provide meaning for each individual by serving as a source of self-definition. We organize meaning around our self-identity. Identities serve as a foundation for meaning in part because of their origins which can stem from a variety of influences including geography, history, fantasies, religion, and many many more. One's identity helps determine how a person views the world and behaves in that world. So our identity is something that is going to define who we are and the experiences we've had and the historical influences we've had. So when we think of our own identity, we should be going back more than just one or two generations. A common trait influencing identity is culture. Identities are socially constructed through a cultural lens. We identify with our initial cultural in-group as a function of enculturation and later expand to other cultural groups or social institutions as a product of interaction. Consequently, society decides which identity is socially appropriate. For example, in the individualistic nature of the United States, army recruits are urged to be an army of one and this emphasizes self-determination, independence, and individual achievement. This emphasis contrasts remarkably with that of a collectivist culture in which identity is strongly connected to and dependent on in-group membership. So the cultural aspects of where you come from oftentimes form the foundation of who you are and in a world where multicultural interactions are increasingly inescapable, identity must be understood. In an essay by Mary Jane Collier, she emphasized that one option we have for understanding why people behave in particular ways and learning how to manage one's intercultural communication effectively is to view communication from the perspective of cultural identity enactment. Her article presents an approach to culture that focuses on how individuals enact or take on one or more cultural identities. Questions that are answered include the following. What is cultural identity? How are multiple cultural identities created and negotiated with others? How can knowledge of the cultural identity approach help you become more competent when dealing with persons who are taking on an identity different from yours and what are the benefits of such an approach to intercultural communication research training and practice so let's kind of look at what culture truly is it is defined as a transmitted system of symbols meanings and norms from a historical chronology Notice the emphasis is placed on communication process in the definition, transmitted. Also notice the culture is systemic, meaning there is a system that we go through. So over here on the right hand side is a little picture with um, what components we usually think of when we are thinking of culture. So starting at uh, the very top, 12 o'clock, we have attitudes, your beliefs, the language you speak or if you speak multiple languages, your customs, um, the rituals that your family and friends go through, behaviors that you consider appropriate or inappropriate, your religion, the food you eat, and then finally the art, the drama and the music or the idea of what the culture produces in terms of these long lasting remnants from each generation. The system is made up of pattern symbols such as verbal messages, nonverbal cues, 
emblems and icons, as well as their interpretations or their assigned meaning. Culture is not only speaking a language and using symbols, but interpreting those symbols consistently. In South Africa, traffic lights are called robots. So if somebody says, watch out, there's a robot ahead, you know, it's, it's not, um, you know, some insane artificial intelligence from Westworld coming to get you. In England, elevators are called lifts. Trucks are called lorries. There's a whole other set of terms, even though both countries ostensibly speak English. In urban areas, gang members change the items of clothing that denote gang membership periodically so that only in-group members know who is in and who is out. So, you know, if you are a member of a particular gang and the colors are fuchsia and lilac, then anyone who is a wannabe is going to wear fuchsia and lilac. Um, that's why those kinds of things are done is to kind of make sure people understand they're not invited into this particular gang or club and as such they are an outsider. Norms are patterns of appropriate ways of communicating. It is important not only to speak with symbols that are understood or to use nonverbal gestures or modes of dress so that the cues will be understood consistently, but also to use symbols at acceptable times with the appropriate people with the appropriate force. So for example, Malay women may wear traditional Muslim dress and show respectful silence to elders in the family, but they may be assertive and use a louder tone of voice among women in social settings. So, you know, it's, it's think about how you act in school versus how you act at home with your family or with your friends. There's differences. There's norms that we intuitively follow because we know what's considered appropriate or acceptable. This cartoon on the right, I think, uh, kind of captures the whole essence of how history or time impacts these norms. It's a woman sitting on a park bench, and she says, back off, weirdo. I'm not the type of girl who dates a guy she hasn't met online. And this, of course, turns the whole idea of meeting someone online as the appropriate way of meeting someone, as opposed to, uh, you know, going to a bar, getting drunk, and meeting your future love muffin. The cultural system of communication is historically transmitted and handed down to new members of a group. Groups with histories include corporations, support groups, national groups, or civil rights groups. History is handed down when new employees are trained, ground rules are explained to new members of such groups as Alcoholics Anonymous, or societal beliefs and the value of democracy are taught to American children in school. So you'll see over here on the right hand side a classroom full of kids saying the Pledge of Allegiance. And you know as far as most of us go we probably can whip it out from our lizard brain because we did it every day in school. Now there are of course you go to another country they're going to be doing their own pledges and songs. So each country has its own historical um, precedence on how to incorporate you into their culture. We learn to become members of groups by learning about past members of the group, heroes, important rules, rituals, values, and expectations for conduct. We learn that George Washington couldn't lie when he cut down the cherry tree. We learn that Abraham Lincoln walked to school five miles in the snow barefoot uphill both ways. You know, all of these things that we're taught in school are there to teach us really what the norms are for our society and our culture. So we shouldn't lie and we should work hard and we should, you know, have self-determination and all those fun things that we were basically brainwashed in school with. And that's not saying that any of those are bad things, 
but they could have had us pledging allegiance to a cabbage and in third grade that would have been really much more fun than a flag in this way we perpetuate the cultural system through historical transmission many groups though not all form cultural systems shared history or geography provides the common denominator of a group's world view or lifestyle and this helps create and reinforce a cultural system of communication to create a culture groups must first define themselves as a group this definition may be made on the basis of nationality ethnicity gender profession geography organization physical ability or disability community or a type of relationship once the group defines itself as a unit a cultural system may develop these kinds of groups base membership on heritage and history that has been handed down among several generations of the same ethnicity or the same nationality their history is based on the traditions rituals codes of language and norms persons who share the same nationality were born in the same country and spent a significant number of years in a period of socialization in that country such socialization promotes and reinforces particular values beliefs and norms so you know when we feel a national identity it's because we have been exposed to the culture to such an extent that it's become part of us because many people contribute to the creation of a national culture symbols meaning and norms national culture is fairly abstract so predictions about language use and what symbols mean can only be generalized so over here on the right hand side are some symbols of the USA that we all kind of recognize we have our starting at the top at 12 o'clock we have our American flag and then the White House no that's actually Congress um, the dollar French fries because you know you you can't think of the USA without thinking of hamburger and fries Uncle Sam's hat and the glorious Statue of Liberty in the middle are some of the tallest buildings in the country which emphasizes our fantastic building ability ethnicity is a bit different ethnic groups share a sense of heritage history and origin from an area outside of or preceding the creation of their present nation state of residence ethnic groups in most but not all cases share racial characteristics and may many have a specific history in having experienced discrimination so in the united states the dominant ethnic groups include the African Americans, Asian Americans, which also include Japanese Americans, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Mexican Americans, Polish Americans, Irish Americans, Native American Indians, um, and Jewish Americans, just to name a couple examples. So, you know, these rituals come from a place of immigrating to a place except for the Native Americans who dealt with their own pile of bad stuff but you know a hundred years ago people used to put signs in their windows no Irish need apply because the Irish were seen as the lowest of the low um, you know during World War two Jewish people couldn't even get into this country um, we stopped allowing them in Canada ended up taking a lot um, we did bring in a certain number but by 1942 things were having to slow down um, and because American you know the people who were here were getting scared of what was going on then you have nowadays where people are freaking out about immigrants coming in from Central America um, where there's civil wars going on and these folks are coming in and they're bringing their own battles with discrimination and prejudice and their own rituals from being a displaced person you know people immigrate for a lot of reasons but most migrants who come into the United States um, are often desperate because they don't have any other choices 
Culture is based on what people say and do and think and feel as a result of their common history and origins. Many subcategories of gender cultures exist. Groups create, reinforce, and teach what is interpreted as feminine or masculine. Groups also reinforce what is appropriate or inappropriate for a good husband, wife, feminist, chauvinist, heterosexual, gay, or lesbian. So, you know, if you look at somebody like Ellen DeGeneres, you're going to say, oh yeah, she's totally a lesbian. But if you look at her wife, Portia de Rossi, you know, with the long blonde hair and looks very, very hyper-feminine, you might say, mm, she doesn't look like a real lesbian. So, you know, these kinds of things, in our head, we've got them set up as this is what a good husband looks like. This is what a gay guy looks like. This is what a chauvinist pig looks like. So when people go outside of that little character in our head, it confuses us. Mothers and fathers, religious leaders, teachers, and the media all provide information about how to be a member of a particular gender culture. So for example, men holding hands in Saudi Arabia implies a trusted friendship. So the top picture I have over here is George W. Bush, who was president in the early aughts, holding hands with King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, who was king at the time. It's a little awkward because in the United States, when men hold hands, we assume they are in a romantic relationship, which is what we see in the picture down below. And again, you know, when we think of gay guys, we don't necessarily think of guys all muscled out and, and wearing baseball caps. So again, you know, our definitions change as time goes on and we see people acting differently as a whole. Other cultural influences include your job, um, politicians, physicians, field workers, Sales personnel, maintenance crews, bankers, and consultants share common ways of spending time, earning money, communicating with others, and learning the norms about how to be a member of their profession. So if you become a lawyer, you're going to learn that on Saturday mornings you're going to go play golf with other lawyers and network. Um, same thing with politicians. They're always trying to raise money, so they'll show up anywhere and give a speech for a certain amount of money. Salespeople are always looking to make a sale. So again, these are all norms on what it is to be a salesperson or a politician or a lawyer. In geographical areas, this acts as a boundary contributing to the formation of a cultural group. Rural communities often differ from urban communities in political views, values, lifestyles, and norms. So just to kind of put things in perspective, the two pictures I have here, the top one is a family working, you know, a family farm, uh, four guys out in the middle of nowhere with a big old combine tractor behind them. The second picture below is a crazy busy street in New York City on any given day of the week. Um, you know, New York is seven, nine, ten million people. It's, it's an incredible number. It of course doesn't come close to the uh, numbers that you will see in Asian countries. I think there's 20, bil uh, 20 million people who live in, in Hong Kong alone. So, uh, you know, what you're seeing here is just the difference in how life is for each of these groups you know rural communities they might see going out on saturday night to the town dance to be a highlight whereas in new york city you have your choice of dance clubs and piano clubs and jazz clubs etc organizations also have a culture so large organizations such as ibm nike or xerox create the most common type of organizational culture. Members are taught the corporate symbols, the myths, the heroes and legends and what it means to be an employee. So if you think of Apple, you think of Steve Jobs because he kind of represented, he came to be what Apple became. Um, when we think of 
um, Apple, some of you who are a little bit more on the um, older side or who have been very interested in the company might remember Steve Wozniak who helped Steve Jobs, worked with him. They owned Apple together and he still has a lot of money tied up in Apple but he kind of retired and did his own thing. So you know everybody who knows Steve Woz kind of loves him because he's the antithesis of Steve Jobs. You know Steve Jobs was that skinny rail of a guy who only wore black and had no hair and uh, Steve Wozniak is exactly the opposite. Short and pudgy and um, lots of hair and fuzzy and just the kind of guy that you could sit down and have a beer with. Support groups have their own version of organizational culture. Alcoholics Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, and therapy support groups among others form their own sets of symbols, interpretations, and norms. In terms of physical ability or disability, we also see groups forming based on a shared physical ability. So you have groups of gymnasts, you know, baseball teams, football teams, you have swimmers, you have people who will get together and play pickup basketball because they all love this particular physical activity. In the same way, um, there's a game that wheelchair individuals play called murder ball and this has brought them together to share in the fact that they all have this disability but it hasn't inhibited their desire to compete. So each individual then has a range of cultures to which he or she belongs in a consistently changing environment. Everyone may simultaneously participate in several different cultural systems each day, week, and year. All cultures that are created are influenced by a host of social, psychological, and environmental factors as well as institutions and context. Cultures are affected not only by changing socioeconomic and environmental conditions, but by other cultures as well. So when we look at ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we are defined by? Is it our gender, our religion, our ethnicity? Is it the time we live in? You know, for those of you who may be a little bit older and remember 9-11, which happened in 2001, you know, that was pretty much a defining moment for many people in the United States. And um, especially in terms of security and giving up their right to privacy, which has been an ongoing struggle since then. The point is, is that because 9-11 was such a um, milestone example of what happens in a country that has terrorism um, impacting it will change the entire culture you know everybody wore a little flag on their lapel for the year after 9-11 everybody wore t-shirts with the flag on them it was this patriotism of I'm proud of this country and we will rebuild no matter what In terms of cultural identity, diverse groups can create a cultural system of symbols used, meanings assigned to the symbols, and ideas of what is considered appropriate and inappropriate. When the groups also have a history and begin to hand down the symbols and norms to a new member, then the group takes on a cultural identity. Cultural identity is the particular character of the group communication system that emerges in a particular situation. So a man getting married in a kilt, wearing the traditional Scottish belt with that uh, little furry thing in front of him, I can't really see, can't remember what it's called. He's also going to have knee socks on with a little dagger in the side of his sock. Um, this is a very traditional dress for a Scottish person when they get married and it is considered part of their cultural identity in the same way that someone when they graduate from college may prefer to wear um, something that reflects their culture on the hat that they're given the mortarboard that they wear on their head so you can see you know Irish pride and gay pride and African pride and all of those standing out when you're watching people graduate 
Cultural identities are negotiated, co-created, reinforced, challenged, and this is done through communication. Lev Vygotsky, who is a uh, researcher in human development and lifespan psychology, said, and this is on the right hand side, through others we become ourselves. Who we are and how we are differ depending upon who we are with, the cultural identities that are important to us and others, the context, the topic of conversation, and our interpretations and attributions. So we are a constantly changing dynamic because culture is constantly changing and the people we're interacting with are constantly changing. So why do we study cultural identity? We can apply our knowledge about cultural identities and how they're enacted and developed in order to explain and improve our understanding of other people's conduct, their actions. Researchers have defined characteristics of cultural identities and then compared the properties across different cultural groups. These comparisons ultimately help us build theories of cultural and intercultural identity communications. So this quote on the right here by Oscar Wilde really kind of encapsulates that idea. Most people are other people. Their thoughts are someone else's opinions their lives a mimicry, their passions a quotation. And really what we're looking at here is how much other people contribute to creating who we have become. You know, your mom, your dad, your siblings, your friends, all of them have helped shape you. Um, if you think of a rock in the middle of a river and how the water rushes around it, well over time that rock smooths out because the water is um, rubbing against the, the rock smoothing the sharp edges and that's kind of what people do for us they help us you know smooth out or sharpen our edges each individual may enact various cultural identities over the course of a lifetime as well as over the course of a day a vowel is about the self of an individual portrays. A vowel is the individual saying, this is who I am. Ascription is the process by which others attribute identities to an individual. Stereotypes and attributions communicated are examples of ascriptions. So you may be somebody from, let's say, Liberia and you see yourself as a Liberian American and this is who you are. Somebody else might look at you and just call you a foreigner, that lovely word, and they then stereotype you, can't speak English, don't understand what the United States is all about. So ascription is a much more negative construct, um, whereas a vowel is that personal identity. We also have core symbols, and these tell us the definitions, premises, and propositions regarding the universe and the place of humans in the universe that are held by members of the cultural group. They are expressions of cultural beliefs about the management of nature and technology and such institutions as marriage, education, and politics. Sometimes these core symbols can be summarized into a set of fundamental beliefs. Sometimes a particular mode of dress, gesture, or phrase captures the essence of cultural identity. This symbol on the right-hand right -hand side is something you see in Taoism, which is a Japanese religion. Um, you have two elements, yin and yang. Yang is positive, yin is negative, and so on and so forth. They're the opposites. So in a sense, you can't have goodness without evil. You can't have poverty without richness. You need the opposites for it to become a whole. And that's the entire concept behind Taoism. Then we have labels, which are a category of core symbols. The same label may vary widely in its interpretation. 
the term american is perceived as acceptable and common by many residents of the united states and as ethnocentric and self-centered by residents of central america and canada and is associated with a group that is privileged wealthy and powerful by some countries that are not industrialized the point here is that we call ourselves american with pride other people from other countries may not see the word american in such a positive perspective especially right about now in canada they're not too happy with our current president whether the label was created by members of the group or members of another group provides full information about what the label means and how it is interpreted So we'll move on to norms, which uh, for conduct are based upon core symbols and how they are interpreted. Defining who you are tells you what you should be doing. Norms of appropriate and acceptable behavior, moral standards and expectations for conduct and criteria to decide to what degree another is behaving in a competent manner form the prescriptive or evaluative aspect of cultural identity. So basically, norms tell us what's the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. Attention to the property of shared norms gives us the ability to determine what is appropriate from the point of view of the group members. Comparing norms of conduct across groups and identifying norms in intercultural conversations is helpful in figuring out how to improve our own individual effectiveness as a communicator. So. Uh, over here on the right is some examples of norms in this country. Uh, respect for the American flag, cover your mouth when you yawn or cough, not wearing your underwear in public unless you are Madonna, and marrying only one person at a time. Um, and again, you know, these are just norms in this country. You might go to a country like Saudi Arabia where polygamy is practiced um, and you know the norm is a man to have two wives so it really just depends on all of those factors we've discussed in terms of what makes our culture our culture identities have individual relational and communal properties as researchers of culture we can study culture from the point of view of individuals when we study culture from a relational point of view, we observe the interaction between people, friends, coworkers, or family members who identify themselves as members of the same or different groups. When we study culture in terms of its communal properties, we observe the public communication contexts and activities in communities and neighborhoods that establish cultural identity. Rituals, rites of passage, and holiday celebrations are other sources of information about how persons use cultural membership to establish community with one another. Cultural identities are both enduring and changing. Cultural identities change because of economic, political, social, psychological, and contextual factors, not to mention the influence of other cultural identities. Uh, the picture on the right are three uh, Muslim women who are wearing what's known as a burkini. It is a burqa for the uh, beach or swimming pool and um, some hardline fundamentalist Muslims thinks this is incredibly inappropriate and shocking and horrifying and other people just shrug and go why are those girls wearing so many clothes. The point being is that 10 years ago in these countries like Afghanistan, you would never have seen women wearing a burkini. Instead, you know, they would have been stoned in the street. Now women are gaining and gaining more power in the Middle East. You know, recently women were just given the um, ability to get driver's licenses in Saudi Arabia. So again, we have to keep in mind that you know our cultural identity is not fixed it's changing and it changes often because of things outside of our control 
The affective component of identity relates to how the person's emotions change depending upon the situation. The cognitive component of identity relates to the beliefs we have about that identity. Persons hold a range of beliefs about each cultural group they are a part of. The behavioral component of cultural identity focuses on the verbal and nonverbal actions taken by group members. We become members of a group through our actions with one another and our reactions to one another. So over here on the right hand side is a breakdown of the cognitive, affective, and behavioral attitudes about somebody who is um, considering what they feel about gun control. So your cognitive are your beliefs and ideas and this person's idea or belief is gun, order, gun owners are more likely to shoot a loved one than a criminal. They're feeling their effectiveness just guns just make me feel sick and then their behavioral action is I vote for gun control politicians. So when we break this down we're able to see how the three elements of our attitude cognitive, affective, and behavioral all coexist and work together. Identities comprise both content and relationship levels of interpretation. Sometimes persons use their in-group language to reinforce their in-group status status and establish distance from the outgroup. At other times they may use the language of the outgroup in order to adapt and align with the outgroup. Mexican Americans may speak Spanish when in neighborhood communities to preserve their history and roots and to reinforce their identification and bond as people. The same persons may speak English at school or at work because the supervisor and executives of the company require it. So, you know, people have a very important relationship with their identity and their culture. And, you know, um, a lot of corporations and a lot of places try to make you neutral. And there's always this little bit of your personal culture that you can kind of allow to creep in, even just saying hola instead of hi. Identities differ in their salience, being particularly notable or important. So on the right hand side I have a salience, the orange is standing out. Um, in particular contexts and identities are enacted with different intensities at different times. So if you are um, a guy who doesn't really show his feelings too much but you're you know passionately in love with your girlfriend or boyfriend and you want to ask them to marry you you might go over the top with the romance you know carriage ride through the park candlelit dinner music the engagement ring all of these things are contextually based whereas at work you don't need to be romantic one hopes or if you work with your love muffin that's fine too. Cultural competence is demonstrated ability to enact a cultural identity in a mutually appropriate and effective manner. Intercultural competence is the reinforcement of culturally different identities that are salient in the particular situation. Intercultural competence occurs when the avowed identity matches the identity ascribed. So when you have, I, I am this person, I am an African American or I am an Asian American and that's how others see me, then I've achieved intercultural competence. Some benefits of the cultural identity approach in intercultural communication situations include we can acknowledge that all individuals have many potential cultural identities which may emerge in a particular situation. Remembering that identities change from situation to situation can be helpful in overcoming the tendency to treat others as stereotypical representatives of a particular group. Asking for information about what is appropriate for their cultural identity is an effective tool in becoming interculturally competent 
and you know don't be a jerk when you ask be nice about it would it be okay if I used a fork instead of chopsticks or would you mind showing me how to use chopsticks explaining what your own cultural identity norms are why you behave in a particular way can also be useful to increase the other person's understanding and can help develop relational trust so you have to develop a communication competence before the intercultural competence really comes into play so next we're going to look at an essay by Gua Min Chen an alternate view of identity and he makes a very good point about modern day society and how globalization has impacted it so significantly. The impact of globalization has led scholars from different disciplines to study the concept of identity from various aspects and encourage people to find, maintain, and negotiate their identity. Unfortunately, abundant research seems to further mystify the concept. The aggressive advocate of the importance of establishing, authenticating, maintaining, or negotiating one's own or group identity may motivate people to tightly hold on to their own culture. The problem has a tendency to weave a stronghold, preventing a person from penetrating the identity of others. Facing this dilemma, Guo Min Chen offer, attempts to first offer a critical overview of this line of research and then to propose a different view on the nature of the self and identity from an Asian perspective. So identity has become a significant concept among social science scholars since the 1960s. Identity theory and social identity theory represent the two main perspectives in this line of research. Hogg, Terry, and White indicated identity theory, which originated in sociology, deals with the structure and function of people's identity as related to the behavioral roles they play in society, and social identity theory, which was originated in psychology, deals with the structure and function of identity as relates to people's membership in groups. Identity theory mainly views the social nature of self from the role positions a person occupies, and the role identities vary with respect to their silence. So identity theory is about the self. Social identity theory is about the self in social groups. Social identity theory was rooted in Tafel's studies on social and cultural factors in perception, cognition, and beliefs. The theory concentrates on subjects of social self, group processes, and intergroup relations. More and more scholars felt the need to establish a general theory that can integrate the two theories, social identity and identity theory, to avoid the redundancies of studies on the different aspects of the self and identity. It is ironic that given the importance of culture in anthropology, scholars are unable to give a more focused view on the cultural perception of the self or person and how it affects the emergence of identity. So the study of identity in communications is mainly conducted from the intercultural communication perspective. Researchers investigate how identity is constructed through and affects interaction and how it is influenced by dominance and power from the aspects of intergroup approach, cultural approach, critical cultural approach, and post-colonial approach. The intergroup approach applies social identity theories to explain the role social identity plays in the process of communication from the perspectives of risk reduction and cultural languages. Identity in this approach is considered a cultural product and is formed through culture embedded in group members' interaction. So as people interact, they're developing their culture. The critical cultural approach is grounded in the sociological perspective of critical theory and expanded on by Hall through his studies on the re media presentation of race, identity, culture, and ethnicity. This approach views identity as an ideological construct 
and represents the power structure which mirrors the political inequality and oppression toward class, gender, and race. So in this concept, you know, culture is what has dominated society and then these other cultural constructs um, are a, an essential, an enemy of the dominant culture. So, you know, in this perspective, this conflict perspective, perspective, you know, men are looking to keep women subjugated. Uh, white people are looking to keep black people subjugated. The rich um, people want to keep the middle class down. And this is a very common approach that's addressed not only in communication, but in sociology as well. In order to remedy this problem, an alternative view on the study of self and identity is explored. Individual identity is established in Western culture as a dynamic center of awareness, emotion, and action. The self, from the Western perspective, is characterized as autonomous and egocentric. It is then important to attend to the self, to assert the self, and to emphasize one's difference from others. The Western conceptualization of the self and identity has been facing challenges from cross-cultural studies feminism, social constructivism, systems theory, critical theory, and deconstructionism. The cross-cultural research has provided alternative views on self and identity from different cultural traditions. This section provides a different view from Asian cultural traditions by focusing on the Taoist perspective. Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism and Taoism form the foundation of Asian philosophical and religious thought and each of the four traditions provide a specific view on the self and identity. As the dominant paradigm of social life in Far Eastern areas, Confucianism suggests an ethnic guideline based on Wi Lun, the five codes of ethics, which governs the five basic human relationships of the ruler and subject, father and son, husband and wife, older brother and younger brother, and between friends. Now, obviously, when this was developed, women were not held in that high of esteem, so you're not seeing sister to sister or mother to daughter, but we can imply those for the sake of this essay. The structure of these relationships is particularistic, hierarchical, reciprocal, interrelated, formal, and in-group, out-group, distinct. The self is demonstrated through the role one plays in this relationship network. Ho stated that the Confucian self is a relational self, which emerges only in the social presence of others. The ultimate goal of life is to realize the self through self-cultivation in a harmonious relationship. The absence of another's presence will lead to the loss of one's identity. So in a, in a sense, we're also getting into that existential idea of without purpose, you have no sense of living. So without relationships, you have no sense of identity. Hinduism considers the self an illusion originated from ignorance. Thus, an individual identity has no way to exist. If there is a true self, it will be identical with ultimate Brahman, which is the ultimate and sole reality. The Buddhists believe that the realization of self cannot be sought because the self does not exist, so much like Hinduism. This leads Buddhism to advocate that people should liberate themselves through meditation to reach the state of nirvana, not the early 90s rock band, in which there is the total detachment from or no more transmigration of the impermanent self or identity. In other words, you know, you meditate till you reach that completely detached form and you become one with Buddha's spirit. The Tao Taoists take a different route to deal with the self and identity. 
compared to the views of Confucianism, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Unlike Buddhism and Hinduism, Taoism recognizes the existence of the self and identity, which is different from the Confucian relational self. The Confucian self is an extension of or defined by social relationships. Instead, the self is but a manifestation of the Tao, or God. It is identical with and equally co-produces with the universe. This is different from Hinduism because after being identical with the Tao, the self or the individual identity will ultimately be lost. So the idea here with Taoism is that the identity is not lost but becomes part of the Tao. Transcending one's egocentricity results in freedom from partiality and partisanship and achieving equality among coexistences. In order to reach this coexisting state within the Tao, the self needs to acquire the ability of great empathy. Great empathy completely rejects the distinction between subject and object through the process of Wang Wo, forgetting myself which leads to the transformation of all things. Through the process of transformation, the universe and I exist together, and all things and I are one, as Shuang Zhu said. So according to Chen and Star Rasta, the grand fusion between Tao, i.e. God, and the individual sense of self is achieved through great empathy which is embedded in two human abilities, creativity and sensitivity. Creativity is the basis of egolessness. Sensitivity, on the other hand, breaks down the diversity into unity by moving from many to one through the process of differentiation and discrimination. Sensitivity promotes creativity that can produce and reproduce potentiality and possibilities so they work together through sensitivity an individual is able to obtain shared communication symbols and project the self into another person's mind by thinking the same thoughts and feelings the same emotions as that person so basically you know that's really the definition of empathy Hence, the contraction and expansion between sensitivity and creativity manifests itself within the infinite fusion. I know this is very complicated stuff, but the idea here is that, you know, every culture has a view of self and identity that's a little bit different, and we have to begin to explore the very notion of identity and self in order to truly understand how to culturally communicate effectively. So it is here that we see the potential contribution of Taoist thinking in presenting an alternative view on the self and identity that is different from the Western practice and other Asian philosophical and religious thoughts. The free movement between subject and object or between the self and the other demonstrates the ability to release the stronghold of the ego, penetrating the culture cocoon, overcoming the boundary, and diminishing the wall between different identities. So another aspect of this is that globalization has impacted the inherent meaning of self and identity. So the dominant Western value of individualism indicates that an individual should strive for independence from others by attending to the self and asserting one's unique personal attributes. Contrasting that, the Taoist advocates the importance of attending to the self and others simultaneously by fitting in and being harmoniously independent with each other. The Taoist method of treating the self and identity avoids the fit pitfalls of Western's individualism and overemphasis on the self and individual identity. So it's much how we look at nature, 
the two different worlds. The Western world, we look at nature as something to be tamed and put under our control. Whereas the Eastern philosophy is the idea of nature and man coexisting peacefully together with a deep respect going both ways. So, you know, what we're saying with this particular example is that it is better to acclimate and work with someone of a different culture in a non-aggressive, non-assertive way, but to kind of mirror how they react to us and we respond to them in like kind. So that's it for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to text or email your instructor. If you are not in our class but still have questions, please leave a comment below and we will be happy to get back to you as quickly as possible. Thank you and have a great day.